Hello and welcome to uh, the very first recording of uh, our podcast, uh, probably yet to be titled. Uh, and uh, today, my special temporary guest co-host is Joe Obish. And uh, Joe Obish, if you would like to introduce yourself a little bit, so uh, people who may have forgotten who you are and the, the break you've taken from publicly berating SQL Server. Uh, why, don't, why, don't you, why don't you tell the nice folks why they should pay attention to you? Well, as we said before, this is part of my public rehabilitation. I even, you know, dusted off my uh, my uh, most impressive uh, SQL Server shirt, right? You mm -hmm. uh, see the speaker here? Yeah. yeah. Um, I started SQL Server work in 2011, and I remember when I used to think that wasn't very long ago. Uh, <laughs> You know, now I've got like gray hair and uh, and uh, everything. It's it's terrible. Um, I've done a lot of query performance tuning. I've worked on servers as small as four cores and as large as a hundred eight. Um, done some comp store ETL work, some OLTP. Don't uh, undersell that column store ETL work, you bozo. That's some of your right, most right, impressive right, well, stuff. So, <laughs> the best presentation I ever gave and will ever give is on that subject. It's way more impressive than, than what Eric and I are going to do here. <laughs> so, you know, if, if you make it to the end and think, you know, that was okay, but I want something even better, it's uh, on YouTube. You can I'll, find it. I'll, put, I'll put the link in the show notes. Okay, cool. So that people don't have to go figure out how to spell your name and then figure out what you were talking about on YouTube. So okay. we'll, make, we'll make that easy on people. Okay. Are you done? I mean, yeah. I don't All right, know. Is, fine. Is, did, did, I, did I forget something important? I, I don't know. You tell me. It's it's your it's your bio. You can you can say what you can keep going. Say whatever you want. Uh, no, no, no. All right. Well, That's it. I forgot to mention Joe is live from the uh, Wisconsin State Penitentiary today. <laughs> He's in the library right now. Uh, uh, my name's Eric Darling. Uh, I am a consultant extraordinaire. Uh, I do all SQL Server performance tuning work, and uh, I, I have a I have a blog and a YouTube channel. And th those links will be in the show notes too, just in case uh, anyone who finds me was unaware of the fact that I have I have those things. So that's fun. Today we're going to be talking about what developers need to know about transactions because apparently. Developers really don't know anything about transactions. That's been my experience. That many developers, when uh, when we're when I'm working with clients, uh, are using transactions and more like abusing transactions. And today we're hoping to uh, share some of our professional wisdom about transactions, so that hopefully the the developing the the developer community at large can start using transactions and stop abusing transactions. So, Joe, uh, take it away. Uh, and I'm, I'm just here for color commentary. Joe's going to provide all the all the audio genius for this one. So let's yeah. <clears throat> let's go for it. You're going to share is, that screen, which or you're going to talk? A, a, a nice way of you know saying that Eric's making me do most of the work. Yeah, um, as usual. So <laughs> I specialize in. You know, there's there's not knowing a lot about transactions, and then there's like like knowing the wrong thing or like having bad habits mm -hmm. um, like i've worked at companies where the things developers you know they i think they know they'd be better off knowing nothing um <laughs> the primary relationship that developers had with the transaction log was it's important to write as little data as possible the transaction log that was their like overriding consideration for how they wrote their code and you know to be fair i mean there is some value in that right if if you can do the same amount of work in a way that writes less data that'll be good for performance but this was taken to an extreme you know even to the point where in a big you know complicated etl process they would always batch their transactions both into the final destination of the reporting database, but even on the staging database, which was, you know, a simple recovery model. It's supposed to be a temporary workspace, but they were, you know, they were batching those transactions because um, 
they were fighting against the uh, transaction log. <laughs> they uh, w- they weren't working with it. They viewed it as their enemy. They, they they wanted to give it as little data as possible, and that caused a lot of problems. Uh, performance was bad. Scalability was bad. Sometimes they would try to add new features to the ETL, and they just couldn't. Um, they had some process. I forget what it's called. It was like some fixed process where you know if the ETL process for a table was was canceled midway, they would then have a bunch of code that would try to undo the partial progress that was made because you know they 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 weren't using transactions in the way that they should. They were right. fighting against the whole concept. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you can imagine how complicated and horrible that procedure was. So. I, I sure can. So, so, did, where, so, in, in in cases like that, where you know they just wanted everything to roll back, uh, what 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 prevented them from using something like set exact abort on so that they got they got a more they got a better rollback scenario from things? It was because you know to take one of the well. It was because they would do something like, you know, say you're loading a million rows in, mm-hmm. into, into this table. They'd load like 100,000 at a time, mm-hmm. each in their own separate transaction. Oh. So it would be something like, you know, if, if they load half a million, but then the customer cancels it or something, they would then have a fixed procedure that would run, oh. which, would, which would delete those 500,000 rows that they had inserted. Oh. So, yeah, like, it was really something. That um, that is that is charmless, if we're being honest. I ended up so <laughs> that among other things makes me want to say that you know uh, to to any developers out there who who are, who are listening or watching, transactions are your friends. They're not something to fight against. They're there for your benefits. Um, yeah, you know, it's part of the way that the database can serve you. Um, it, you know, it's a way to, to protect the data, make sure the data is there. It's a way for you to get the results you're expecting, and it's a way for DBAs and customers and your boss to bug you less. Because you know, if uh, you write code and your code loads data wrong, well, that can be a big problem. Mm. So you know, if you take if you take nothing else away from this, I would, you know, leave with the sentence of transactions are your friends. Um, <laughs> you know, and, you know, like Eric has a lot more friends than me. So, you know, like I'm kind of reduced to thinking of, you know, SQL server transactions as, as being my friends. But um, that's, 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 that's just how it is. And that's, that's why Joe uh, names all his transactions. Oh, yeah, that actually is a thing. You, that you that is actually a thing. We're... I uh making an executive decision that that is not important enough to uh, cover here, but you know, maybe in part two. All right. Okay. So, all right. I'm I'm gonna try to share Exhibit A. Yeah, let's do it. And all right, can you see uh, some? Oh, I see. We're we're starting to share. We got some purple dots. Oh no. <laughs> You know, really it worked working. so well when you weren't recording. It, it it really did. All right. Yeah, it was flawless. Let's, let's, let's uh, try it again. Um, maybe maybe you're are, are you are you connected to a VPN or something? No, I'm not connected to a VPN. Is it <laughs> there you go. Now? Look at that. Worked instantly. All right, great. Um, so Eric, this is going to be used in the uh, quiz, so you uh, need to pay real, real, real close attention to this. Mm. Um. So let's say you know your your task or a simple procedure that either creates a new record if there isn't one or it updates an existing record, and you you know you're knowledgeable enough to know that that kind of pattern is called an upsert. You uh, do some searching on Google, you find yourself reading some confusing blog posts about <laughs> like what the right upsert pattern you should use is. You know it uses all kinds of things you don't know. You're not really big on reading in the first place, so you think okay whatever. I'm not going to do updates. I'm just going to delete the record if it's there and then insert it. I'll solve all my problems. Now, this code is kind of dangerous where if the procedure fails for whatever reason after the delete but before the insert, you've then lost data. Mm -hmm. 
So Eric, it's uh, time for your quiz. Time for my quiz. Oh boy. What are the reasons you can think of as to why this procedure could fail after the delete, but before the answers? Uh, I would say maybe if there is a trigger or a foreign key or something else that, uh, that, that would cause a conflict with the, with the delete. All right. I actually didn't have those, so you've already passed. Uh, can, hey. can, you th can you think of any other reasons why? Any other reasons yeah, why? But, um, yeah. Let's see. Why why the delete would fail and, the, and cause no, the insert? The, 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 the delete would succeed, but the insert would fail. Oh, the delete would succeed, but the insert would fail. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh, we're deleting an ID, so my like you know the first thing that would come to mind would be some sort of constraint violation. But you know, uh, I guess you know if you're already deleting, like I'm, so I'm assuming that ID is the primary key of the table. So if you'd already deleted that and then you went to insert the same value, then it wouldn't be a primary key violation. Uh, yeah, I can't think of I can't think of any quick reasons why the insert would fail. Maybe a deadlock. Maybe. Uh, Maybe, uh, uh, I mean, I'm going, I'm going back to triggers and foreign keys, but that's 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 about what I can come up with. All right, well, you have passed. Uh, congratulations. So, um, Sweet. You know, just to go over the scenario again, it's, you know, if, if, if we're trying to update an existing record and the delete succeeds but the inserts fails, we've then just wiped out that old record. Mm -hmm. So we, we've lost data. So that's why this code pattern is dangerous. Now, in terms, you know, like, I'm a pessimistic person when it comes to writing T-SQL. I try to view it defensively, you know, like assume the procedure can fail at any point for any reason. And if it does, make sure that the data you expect is still in the database. So the things that I thought of were, um, you know, you could just have a hardware failure or okay. a power outage. It's a bit severe, but sure. I mean, hey, I mean, you know, these <laughs> these uh, things happen, right? Uh, the janitor's mopping knocks the power cord out. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I mean, hey, it's, I mean, you know, these these, 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 these things happen, maybe not all the time, but they happen. That's true. Yeah. And you wouldn't yeah. want to lose your valuable data in sure, uh, ta yeah. table one, Yeah, right? That would be totally. uh, a, a death blow for the business. Um, <laughs> maybe some DBA doesn't like you and he uh, kills the process. Um Sure. Long running you know, delete. They, or worse, they ha they have an automated script that looks for blocking and says if there's any yeah, blocking whatsoever, right. that kill that spid. I mean, and I'm I'm sure that uh, someone's done that. Um, of course. <laughs> you could have a lock wait for the insert, and you hit a client uh, timeout. Sure. Um, someone could be patching Windows or SQL Server, or you know, maybe maybe the trans or maybe TempDB fills up and they just. Oh. Restart SQL Server all yeah. together to you know fix it because that's how you fix that. So. Yeah, totally. Oh, a failover. Failover. Yeah. Uh, your transaction log could fill up. You mm -hmm. know, um, if you make it all the way to the end, then hopefully you know the developers watching won't be doing, causing those issues anymore. <laughs> um, yes. There could just be some bug in in, in a SQL Server that that makes it fail. Like sure. You have a non-yielding scheduler mm. or just some you know. Just some horrible error. Um, yeah. So I think I, I think I think what you're telling people is that they, they, sometimes when they're they're writing code, they need to think outside the code as what could go wrong with with yeah, stuff, which, with, stuff which, with stuff that's happening in there. There is a which greater I think world is out there. What tripped you up? Because it seems like you're focusing on, on just the code. Not yeah. Like no. Valid, but, yeah. You know, no. I was I was very focused on stuff yeah, that's it's... going on in the database. But sure, you're you're absolutely right. I was I was in the developer bubble. It's, uh, it's, it's myopic. Is that the right word? Myopic. Um, I think so. Yeah, but sounds right. I mean, those. those Let's just those, roll with those. It. Yeah, those, those aren't the kinds of words that we should be using. <laughs> um, and you know, like, I'm sure all the developers who are, you know, dedicated and uh, ambitious enough to watch this, they all write perfect code, but you know, yeah, someone could modify your code later. Someone yeah. could modify the. Uh, Table schema, like sure. What if, like, what if someone shrinks the size of that uh, fire car column? Yeah, you know, that that, whenever, whenever there's a problem with my code, I like to say it's not, it's not, it's my, it's perfect code in an imperfect world. 
So yes. you know, we just have to just yes. have to deal with the imperfections around us. So you know, even the most innocent looking of procedures, like you can fail for all kinds of reasons sure. at any time, at any moment, and <laughs> just like in transact- life, folks. <laughs> and <laughs> transactions, you know. They can help you. All right. So this is our improved code. Now, admittedly, this mm-hmm. is not code that you should be using as a template. There are still lots of <laughs> things to complain about. Especially the but, formatting. You know, um, that aside, you know, at a bare minimum, I've added a transaction. So now, assuming like you know reasonable configuration, like if the delete succeeds, the insert fails, that delete gets rolled back. And now you're not just losing data because of, you know, some horrible gremlin in the database mm. made your code fail. So this is, this is why I say that transactions are your friends, you know, like they protect you from losing data. You know, there are a lot of bad things that can happen at any time in a database, um, you know, and transactions can help you. They can protect you and they can make your job easier. Sure. Um, now, of course, you know, if you're doing this for real, you should look at Aaron uh, Bertrand's upsert log oh, post. There, goes your just, reha- you know, there goes your rehabilitation. <laughs> just uh, use Aaron that. Bo- Bo- um, Bo- 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 hey, look, I, I'm uh, like the president. <laughs> I've uh, had a stutter my whole life and I'm. Uh, <laughs> doing my best you know <laughs> even if you have a stutter you, you can still you know fly to such great heights as being a speaking at speaker. past summer 2019 that's right yeah, you uh, got it the the, the, the uh, last good past summer <laughs> that was a great uh, summer. it uh, was a great one yeah. yeah you were there i was there i was there we, we hung out it was wonderful all right, so Eric has uh, passed the quiz. Um, the whole quiz? Yeah, a little bit. Like, like I said, you, you you only had to get one. Oh, okay. Well, you know, yeah. I, I do like to set a low bar. Um, so switching gears here. Um, oh, boy. You know, sometimes you might find yourself running a store procedure in production, you know, as part of troubleshooting. Mm-hmm. Um, or really just anywhere else. And... If if that procedure fails, your transaction might not roll back. And you can find yourself in a place where, you know, you have an open transaction without realizing it. And if your database isn't using accelerated database recovery, that can effectively cause a production downtime. Because while your transaction's open, you know, if you've modified any data you can't have log reuse. You know, the transaction log can't wrap around and roll back and rewrite over your changes. Mm. So, you know, like, I mean, I, I've definitely experienced this. I'm sure Eric has too, where, mm-hmm. you know, someone has a, <laughs> someone has open transaction they don't know about, a, 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 a few hours pass, and suddenly all kinds of code are, are, is, is just failing yep. across the board. Yep. Um, you know, the, only, the only thing I can really say here is, you know, if your code fails, make sure you don't have an open transaction. Um, How would one do that, Joe? What are some techniques? They could close the SSMS tab and it, <laughs> it'll, it'll give you a, a warning about, oh, you have an open transaction. If you want to close it, you know, you could just type rollback transaction. Sure. If you have one to close it, if not, it fails, but it's, there's uh, no big deal. Um, that's what I would come up with. Sure, but you most, any most, mo- well, I mean, most developers don't. Or rather, most applications don't function by developers running queries for people in SSMS. So, uh, well, I would... I'm talking about a, 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 a oh, oh scenario. like an ad hoc yeah. scenario where yeah, ad hoc, someone's yeah. doing something. Sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, if you're going, if you're, I mean, so I, I think that if you're going to use a transaction, uh, the things that you need to do to prepare that transaction for success are uh, to use set exact abort on. So that in, that ensures that everything rolls back, uh, not just the, the thing that failed. Uh, I, and I also think that you need, you need to uh, have a catch block on your code 
that if there's an error, you can it, you can so that you, when when if there's an error, I mean, I'm not saying that errors are inevitable. If there's an error, uh, you can make sure that uh, you you th you have a rollback command in that catch block, and that you also have uh, a good record of what error occurred uh, by by using some of the built-in error functions. And uh, I think that. Uh, you know the the throw command is mighty helpful. Uh, you know if you can throw throw a raise error that maybe gives you some additional. So like if your code is using a, a loop or if your code is uh, you know setting any uh, variables or using any parameters that you can you can use uh, raise error to sort of give you which, uh, which which like part of the loop or like which uh, parameter or variable values were part of the error. I think there's a lot of stuff that. Uh, people don't put into code because uh, it's a lot of extra typing, but a lot, that all that extra typing can can really can really save your hide when uh, you do have un, uh, unexpected transaction failures. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, That's why you're here. Connor with is though, you know. Oh well, but I have a thousand procedures, and none of them do that. And you know, mm, yeah. I couldn't possibly update them to do it all, or I'm calling some horrible third party procedure that I uh, mm. can't modify and you know they they haven't seen your wisdom you know That's they true. haven't seen the light so they don't know how to do those things uh, what do you think about setting transact abort on as like a default connection setting uh, I think you know I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't I wouldn't say no to it uh, I wouldn't say no to it out of hand uh, it might be overkill for some procedures, but you know, for the for the even for the procedures that it's overkill for, like, who cares? Like, like I'd, I'd rather have it there to safeguard the ones that it's not overkill for, than to you know, uh, have it have it not on for ones that you know, like if it's just a select query like in a procedure, whatever, right? Like, or if it's just like a reporting procedure. Like uh, then whatever. Like who who this if it if, if like what like inserts to it like to temp tables or whatever are gonna roll back. I don't care. I just, it's like for for those for like I, I view it as a good general guardrail for an application. Uh, and you know you can you can make a choice in certain procedures to turn it off if you if you really want to get crazy. But you know I think I think that it would be a good general guardrail for for most applications that I see, especially ones. Driven by third-party vendors who are generally clueless as to how to work with SQL Server. If you had it on the connection level, would you still add it at the top of every new procedure you're making? Uh, I don't know. Uh, th that might be a whole lot more work. I mean, it's sort of like sort of like if you think about, uh, you know, the difference between. So like let's let I mean let, let's say you had RCSI and snapshot turned on. I wouldn't go turn snapshot on for a procedure unless I absolutely need it. Like unless something specific about that procedure needed like the specific behavior of snapshot isolation. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't go and put that at the start of every procedure as well. So like, you know, uh I can't think of a great reason to to go into every procedure if you're setting it on at the connection level and also set it on there, but you know, maybe maybe you've seen something interesting that I haven't. No, I mean, I was just, you know, I find it a little bit odd that it seems like most of the online discussions about this are you should add to every procedure. And very rarely do people say, oh, we'll just turn it on at the uh, connection level and then you're done. You don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like to your point, like technically you could get some bad behavior i think <clears throat> if you have a, if you have an application already going like you might have some badine error like you know someone has some someone tries to, like close a uh, cursor twice because they just have something copy and paste or something sure and you know now that would be not able to execute but i, I think in general like you know it's hard to imagine many scenarios where you want that setting turned off I did do that once. You uh, should I? Uh, talk, yeah, go for talk it. About so, that? I mean, so you can you can to make talk, a good about, you talk here, about but... why you turn it off. Turned it off once, and I'll tell you uh, how I use it. So you go ahead. So, so this is the uh, transact or what's what's the actual word? It's kind of hard to say. It's a transact abort. Yeah, well, ex exact, uh, exact yeah. abort. 
So so for some, somehow somehow value. X somehow trans got turned into X, so it's exact abort. Exact or maybe it's abortion. execution abortion. I don't know. I, I, I'm pretty sure it, it's exact abort because you know. I mean, you, we don't have to, we're not to type out trans every time, yeah. right? That's no, just too ex, much work. Exact abort. Um, so you know, this is one of those things where you know I was reading a a very lengthy and complete blog post about transactions by mm. a uh, famous European whose name I is it, er, is it Erlen Summerskog? Yeah. Yeah. So, that's not. It's not know, that hard. I, well, it's not that hard because you've you've been to Europe a bunch of times. You're a very well cultured person. Well, you know, also, I've, also, I've it's just it's there. just letters. Some are skog. I mean, all words are just letters. Yeah, okay, well, they're, they're, they're fairly easy to figure out at this point. In life. All right, well, look, look, I always have restraints. I have you here to pronounce <laughs> the European names, so I don't have to. Okay. Um, so I I think I ended up doing a thing that he explicitly warned against, but yeah. you know it's I haven't gotten fired yet, so you know it's true. Good. Um, so my scenario was I I had a DML trigger, and if that DML Spicy. trigger failed for some reason, I didn't want to roll back the you know inserter update. Sure. You know, like like we viewed it as better for the business to very occasionally not have that trigger fire compared mm -hmm. to making the trigger failure cause the data not be inserted. Sure. So the way I did that was, uh, it was, it was horrible. Um, yeah. I explicitly turned off exact, whatever it's called. Yeah. Exactly. I board. used the uh, transaction save points. Okay. I, that I then checked if it was possible to roll back to the save point. Cause in some cases you just can't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for a certain, small class of errors if that trigger fails we just roll back to the save point mm -hmm. and we don't cause the parent insert or update mm -hmm. to fail and it's reasonable it i don't know about that but it I seems mean, look, to work from, um, from my so... point of view on this <clears throat> you were tasked to do a somewhat unreasonable thing in sql server and you had a reasonable reaction to that set of unreasonableness. Sometimes when you have to do unreasonable things, they require unreasonable techniques. So, uh, which, which actually like cancels out like two negative numbers. It makes the unreasonable technique reasonable. That's a, that's a very generous of you to say, but it's actually a, a great segue <laughs> into, into my next one, which is bashing transactions in the database. Okay. Um, I like had like a fire extinguisher analogy that I I, that I like really want to use, mm -hmm. but it's it's uh, not quite perfect. I'm gonna go for it anyway. That's fine. Um, I don't care. You know, few things like, in life are perfect. You know, I feel like batching transactions is often like using a fire extinguisher. You know, like like it solves the immediate problem, but most of the time you might have a AM mess. Yeah. To uh to uh, clean up later. Yeah. Um. I think that. It's easy to fall prey into the wrong mindset. Like, you know, you're a developer, you're writing your code, you you don't want people to bother you. Mm -hmm. Some evil <laughs> DBA I said, so you've met developers before <laughs> messages you and says, Hey, you know, you're a code filled up the transaction log. Mm. You uh you you need to fix it. Mm. You you uh, Google it. You, you find many it. other developers who have suffered in the same way you have. Yeah. And, you know, there are some smart people out there. It's, oh, you know, instead of doing one big transaction, you can do a bunch of little transactions. And oh, then yeah. they just make that change. Yeah. And I feel like in some cases, that's perfectly correct. There's no downsides. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like it, it gets into the minds of, you know, transactions are my enemy. I need to work around the uh, the uh, the uh, tr tr transaction log. So like, I'm a little bit concerned about the whole thing with that respect. Now... In the blog posts of yours that I've read, mm -hmm. I remember you always saying something like, you know, it, it's important to make sure that you are using transactions when you need to. Mm -hmm. Like, if if a set of, you know, DML statements either all needs to commit or no needs to commit, you need to use transactions. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, like, don't use batching when it isn't correct from a business perspective to do so. Sure. Well, I Which, mean, my, my, know, my point of view on batching is that uh, 
like there are times for several reasons when it is absolutely necessary to use uh, any sort of you know archival process that you don't have a, a partition table for that you can quickly switch stuff out. Uh, any sort of data migration process, uh, you likewise probably want to want to batch. And uh, any time that, like, uh, so like there there are times when I'm performance tuning queries that do modifications, and even if a lot of rows aren't being deleted in a like by the by the you know by the whatever uh, you know update delete uh <clears throat> because of the way the database is implemented um the the slowest part of the plan is the part where you actually physically change the data so it could be over indexing it could be uh you know foreign keys it could be triggers it could be any number of things it could just be like you know you're on you're in like an Azure managed thing with like but hardware or like unfair caps on the transaction log that make throughput to it really slow. You know, there's like there's like lots of reasons why like the modification is slow, right? You could just have your like slow ass transaction log. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons why that could be slow. Where I might even take like I might even take something that's only changing like two million rows and batch that up into like you know five hundred thousand row chunks because like the actual data change part of the of the of the plan is the slowest part so it sounds like you're getting back into your you know you're asked to do an unreasonable thing like update millions <laughs> of rows on um low-end hardware as we <laughs> like to call it so you, well, you that, have to that, respond that, that, that wasn't the error yeah. log so um i try to always I think the way that I would summarize it is if, if you're going to batch your DML statements, make sure it's okay if only some of the batches happen. Because mm -hmm. as, as we discussed earlier, you know, your code can fail for all kinds of reasons. Sure. Some of which aren't your fault at all. Sure. And like I have had, I'm sure there's scenarios where it, you know, it would be okay for some of them to happen, some mm -hmm. of them not to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there are some really great use cases for batching. Um, ones that I came up with are, you know, you're deleting old data from an archive or from a log that no one could be looking at. Yep. Or you're you're creating a, a new column that mm -hmm. the application isn't querying yet. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's no reason to load it all at once. Mm -hmm. Or well, like backfilling the column, you mean? Yeah, 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 exactly. Or you know, you're uh, you uh, have a you uh, have a downtime. You have a maintenance window. There are no end users during that wonderful brief period of time. You know, do all the batching you want, mm -hmm. or you know, like if you have to, you're maybe doing some horribly complex thing on some uh, local temp tables. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if batching is the way to do it, then go ahead and batch it because yep. you know no one can see that data. Yep. So you know, all those scenarios share one thing in common, which is there's no end user who can see the data while it's being processed. Sure. I, I think if that's not true, you need to real. You should think critically. You know, like. Is it okay for the end user to see like half the data if they just so happen to query at, at you know an unlucky time? You, you, you mean in the in the unlikely event that the code isn't full of no lock hints anyway, Joe? <laughs> they could just see whatever. Uh, <laughs> see, it, 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 I gets, mean, it gets weird know, out like, there. So I, I mean, mean like, again, this is this is sort of could, the value uh, of optimistic isolation levels, where you know, well, these things come into play I a little bit that's... less. I think, though, I mean, I, I'm not a locking expert, but even if people are using your recommended and favorite isolation level, mm -hmm. um, our, our CSI, like, aren't you kind of creating an, an invalid snapshot to a degree where, you know, the snapshot they might get is we've batched half the data as opposed to all or nothing. So uh, I, I do I do feel like batching can be a little bit defeating even with rscsi on too sure uh you know i mean you, you're i mean you're, you're right if, if if you know if it's a situation where like you just like we're like you know if, if a user sees like the first part of your batch but not the second three parts of your like the next part looks like three parts of your batch or whatever then uh yeah that, that could that could potentially be awkward but at the same time, I think one of the values of batching is that uh, if the user hits refresh enough times, they'll they'll 
but they'll eventually see the right data, which is. Yeah, eventually might be the wrong time, but yeah, no, it's uh, you know, like you know, I I think patching has its place. I have seen a few blog posts that don't even talk about you know alternative perils. You, yeah. Well, like you know, the problem you can run into, which is then you just see part of the data, right? Maybe that's a really big problem. Right. Well, I mean, I I, I have one. I mean, it isn't always, but you no, know, but, it could be. Yeah, but like, look, generally the the stuff that I write that does batches, uh, does batching for. At, at least very specific sets of data where it, it doesn't matter if a if if a user were to see like a like a partial thing. But I also do have a post about uh, how like batching modifications can be great until you know one of the batches fails and then you would need to undo everything you did before. And in that post, I go over using like the output clause with your modification query to like sort of save off the changes so you can undo those changes. Uh, if one of the batches fails and you want to like go back and unbatch things, so I am I am sim I am sympathetic to your to your point that you know batching stuff that could cause incorrect data would be bad, but uh, and, you know, I usually in an don't ideal mess. World, I usually don't do batching. <laughs> in, in an ideal world where we can think of transactions as our friends who are yes. there to help us, you know that entire problem goes away. Now, as we've alluded to, we're often not in an ideal world, but mm. you know, I'm um, like. One of the, like, uh, and this is a topic for another day because we definitely run out of time, but, <laughs> you know, when I was talking about that ETL story from before about how they were batching even staging queries, yeah. and, you know, we ended up rewriting the entire application, and one of the driving principles was, you know, like, let's use transactions in a way that's helpful for us and for the data, mm. and, like, a lot of the fears that developers have, oh, well, we're going to fill up the transaction log. If, if, you know, like, we're updating, like, billions of rows. Yeah. And we, in some cases, we would batch by partition, mm -hmm. but that was it. Like, there wasn't any cheating. Yeah, right. And that, you know, I don't think there, like, was a case where the customer transaction log filled up. Um, yeah. Well, you know, we, I mean... We, we, not every it was, not every transaction log filling up scenario is the fault of a developer though. Like some people are yeah, just sure, woefully unprepared for like the workload that their SQL server is about to do. They might have, you know, they could have they could have like a hundred gig transaction log drive for like a ten terabyte database and that's not gonna go well under most circumstances. Or like, you know, they could be one of those foolish people who like sets like sets like a max data size on their transaction log. And that's not the developer's fault. Like, you know, like developers have to be free to work with data in the way that data is best best worked with and you know for whatever scenario the app the application presents. So I, I like, you know, not every not every, you know, transaction log full error is like some developer's idiot mistake. Sometimes, you know, like there is there are infrastructure issues or there are, you know, uh settings issues with with the database that that caused that that are not like the developers shouldn't have had to worry about you're absolutely right and that's why you're here we had to uh, we had a little bit of work to do in that area too sure. because there were some scenarios you know for the detail thing like customer had terabytes of data well you know like we would tell them oh you, you know you can have a transaction log max size of 20 gigabytes yeah so as, as part of our grand compromise we would like bump that up a little bit yeah and you know like it's really you know not that big of a deal um it reminds me of you know this wasn't exactly a transaction log but in a very important developer database we would do an etl mm -hmm. And there is some comically small drive, and it would, it would like always fill up, yeah. and it would cause the process to fail. Right. We're basically having like um, daily failures, and it was like some forty gigabyte drive; it just wasn't big enough. Yeah. And I was, you know, trying to work with our IT department, who was very frugal, and they uh, weren't cooperating. You know, um, I uh, hit my like five year, ten year mark. And I go, oh, you hit five years, you you uh, get a gift, you know. Would you like this bowl or this like um this this like leather portfolio thing? A bowl. I know a bowl, and uh, I just ignored it because I didn't want it either. And I think my manager's like, oh, you know, you need to pick your gift. What do you want? And my answer was, I, I you know. 
I would I would like to go to Best Buy, buy a hundred gigabyte hard drive, plug it in the server, and then that way, you know, we <laughs> we cannot have developer production go down every single day. And then shortly after that, IT finally cooperated and made the drive a little bigger. Yeah. And the thing the thing stopped failing. Yeah. So it, uh, maybe the forty one gigs. Were, were, you know, yeah, maybe the things were unrelated, but you know, that's. Uh, <laughs> It's something that can happen. Um, yeah, no, totally. Uh, you know, uh, you know, inf infrastructure can be just as much to blame for uh, things as developers can. And you know, well, well, developers are certainly uh, prone to doing strange things in the database. Uh, there are there there are just as many uh, you know uh, either untrained DBAs or sysadmins posing as DBAs who uh, can do just as many goofy and restrictive and uh, harmful and offensive things to SQL Server. So, you know, let's not just, not just blame developers for this. Some developer out there is like, you know, I did everything right, but, you know, this, this two gigabyte log transaction log is just not helping me. You think there are people out there with uh, counterfeit uh, <laughs> past summit speaker shirts? Uh, I mean, counterfeit in the sense that they pro like they bought them from a goodwill store yeah i mean maybe yeah sure i mean you know not to be grim but let's face it if you if you were to die tomorrow that shirt would end up in goodwill <laughs> someone out there would be like cool <laughs> golf polo i'm gonna have to update my will to make sure that doesn't happen no you know well i don't know who you're gonna give that to i don't think you have any friends who could fit in that Yeah. Are you saying um Good. what was that even me? I mean that you know, you're a you're a particularly slender man. Uh, not anymore. Uh, so, you, know. you could you could leave it to anime. Not anymore and the the uh, shirt still fits. All right. <laughs> well it's stretchy. It's a forgiving shirt. I think yeah, I think I mean, most it, speakers it, shirts it, have it's, to be it's... forgiving. <laughs> Like, I, like when I was giving out company T-shirts right, well, at uh, conferences, uh, uh, like like the there would be like you know everything would be gone, but there would be like a pile of extra smalls. All right, all right, all right. I, I don't want us to get canceled on our first <laughs> podcast, so oh, I'm, I'm sure I haven't said some, before. Some uh, T sequel here. All right. Uh, so it's possible to insert the res results of a stored procedure into a table. Mm -hmm. I think everyone didn't doesn't know about that um it certainly has its perils um you uh can't nest it you know so like in other words you you, you uh, couldn't have the store procedure also do an insert into exec mm -hmm. so that just fails in there yep um in some cases you uh don't have a choice so, so for example if you want to get the list of active trace flags i think this is the correct way to do it yeah right that's, like there's, that's what there's I've some seen. dmb or anything you right know, you have to insert the dbcc trace status mm -hmm. results into somewhere mm -hmm. um one thing to know is doing this will cause the entirety of that server procedure to be within a single transaction mm -hmm. which i always thought made sense but by that I, you, by uh, that you mean the store procedure inside the exec not the calling store procedure the one inside the exec. Yeah, yeah 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 exactly um, so this is something to keep in mind where, you know, you're not like, you know, I suppose I should have had a, uh, another picture here to kind of illustrate it visually, but, um, you just draw you some know, arrows on this one, you know, you're effectively forcing in this case, DBCC trace test, which doesn't matter to be in a, in a transaction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that could lead to unexpected behavior. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you have to use this like for, Trace lags or some third party procedure. Um, sometimes I'll use it for cases where I need to use dynamic SQL to insert into a temp table. Mm -hmm. I don't want there to be like, you know, a million cache plans, like like one for every session ID. Sure. Um, I don't I don't think that trade off is always worth it. Um, but sometimes I'll uh, do it. Uh, do, do, do you think I need to explain that better? You want to explain that better? Which part? Like, like, like why someone would. If someone has to load into a local temp table using dynamic SQL, why using insert into exec would be helpful from a planet caching point of view? Uh, 
are you are you talking about like the the like the multiple cash temp tables thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that might that might be a little bit much for this talk. We can we can we can oh, we can okay. we can All do right. a whole thing about dynamic SQL and temp tables. Ooh. We can. Oh, wow. Ooh, we, we have, okay. let's not let's not let's not try to cram everything to. at once here. <laughs> I mean, we 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 still have some time left. All right. Well, um, in, in, in any case, uh, sometimes you find yourself doing this, and you know, you should keep in mind that this will effectively force a transaction. Read my next one. Mm. Right. Well I so for that for that screenshot in particular, there 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 are a couple things that I would warn about. And none of them is the table variable <laughs> in this case. Uh, I will say though that uh, there are times when a table variable is in use like that where I will use exec with dynamic SQL so that I am not constrained by a serial execution plan for the select query inserting into the table variable. Because sometimes those table variables get passed to store procedures as table value parameters. And so like, I, I don't want to like, like do the insert into a temp table, then do then go from the temp table to the to a table variable to pass to the store procedure. Sometimes I'll just hold on to the, the table variable, do the exec with whatever, and then uh, do the exec with dynamic SQL and do the insert that way. So I get like, the, I get that awful looking, like, here's your, here's your select execution plan. And here's your parameter table scan plan. Uh, with this though, like, like the dangers that I would see for this is what if Microsoft decides to change DBCC trace status tomorrow. And all of a sudden you have to use like with table results to get back the tabular results instead of something else. Or like, what if Microsoft adds a column? to dbcc trace status and all of a sudden your your insert starts failing so i think one of the like the two biggest perils aside from the transaction part for doing insert with exec is if the store procedure definition underneath changes but your table definition doesn't change all of a sudden you've got failures and uh yeah that could be could be unfun for you so with with the with the with results sets clause, you can actually specify a subset of columns. Is that right? No, no. Like I'm saying, with well, oh, with oh, with result sets for a store procedure. Yeah, but who who the hell is using right. those? Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, like I, I don't think I've ever used it. I, I think I tried to use it once, and it was a big failure. I, but, yeah, same. You know, to, I, I, well, then it was just like, eh, it was too much. um, but to. Tenle your scenario where Microsoft improves DBCC trace data. I didn't say improve. I said change. I'm 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 uh, I'm being nice to Microsoft. Mm. That's part of my re rehabilitation. Oh, okay. Um, how do you write code that would protect yourself against that scenario? Uh, like, can, can, can you use the the, the result set thing? Like, does I'm, that? I'm do sure it? you could if you. Uh, you could as long as the store procedure. Well, I mean, I guess it would have to for this produces a single result set. Uh. You know, there's some weird stuff about it that, like, I remember from I remember running into while I was using it that I don't remember now. Like, I just remember thinking, "This is too weird for me. I don't want to deal with it." Uh, that uh, sounds familiar. Yeah, and like, okay, well, because uh... but like, I, I was trying to use it with like, like some analysis store procedure to dump it into a temp table, and like even returning a single result, the single result wasn't predictable because the final result set was dynamic SQL and depending on like version and addition and some like parameter things, you could get different columns back from the, and it, like, I just remember it not working well for that, but I could be misremembering and going off on an unnecessary uh, tangent. To further add to my rehabilitation, um, I do have to give Microsoft credit for reducing their breaking changes caused by version upgrades. Because I remember sure. reading, I remember reading release notes where it'd be like, I don't know which what the last version was, maybe it was SQL Server 2016, where they have like this very long list of like, here are all the things that you know changed that that might bring right, code. right, like you know like re, like renaming DMV columns, yep. all kinds of things. Yep. And I remember in like like one release maybe 2017, that that list was effectively like nothing. Yeah. So it seemed like like there was some kind of policy change where. They stopped doing all those breaking changes kind of willy nilly. Right. They seem to get that under control. Um, now they keep deprecating big features, but you know, well, I, I think that is an area where they have improved. So, so I consider every SQL Server feature deprecated until proven otherwise. 
because there there are certain things that uh, have been half implemented for a very long time that uh, that are not deprecated, but just see no further development. Uh, you know, I think the if I if I had to pick like the big three from that, it would be indexed views, partitioning, and Hecaton. So like those features have all been around for well, I mean Hecaton about ten years, partitioning forever, uh, index views forever, and uh, there has not been a lot of very active development and improvement on those features in quite a while. So those features to me are, are deprecated. You can still use them. They're not they're not removed from the product, but they're not undergoing any active development. So I don't I just I, I consider every feature deprecated until something until so, something happens with it they're they're in cold uh, storage a lot more time to unpack that on a uh, different occasion all right that's i don't, i've never heard a, a philosophy like that before um speaking of table variables you remind oh, me boy. of something which i which i don't oh, have spicy. in my notes here that's okay um table variables if you have if you have a scenario yeah. where you need to roll back a transaction but you want to keep data from before mm -hmm. it you can use table variables yes temp tables will roll back i mean yeah, table variables and just like them like local variables too. I guess mm -hmm. like you know I think those are the only ways to do that really. Um, so if you need to do some like fancy error logging or something, that could be a scenario. I think it's not very common. I've very rarely used it myself. No, but, but it's, it's something that people always bring up when they talk about table variables as if it's some saving oh, grace. Oh man, <laughs> I, I don't want to be one of those, you know. No, it's a valid point. Carnival like, Parkers, no, it's it's a valid know. point. If you if like if you if you were to use the contents of a table variable to drive some uh, change, then it would be useful to have that survive an error so that you could undo that change. That's, that's totally valid. I mean, it it just makes you think of one of the first presentations I attended, which. <laughs> I remember asking the speaker a, a difficult question. He didn't know the answer. Yeah. And years later, I realized, wait a minute, that like that guy wasn't actually an expert. He was just some guy, you know. Yeah. Given the presentation yeah. as SQL Starter, which you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, in fact, it's it's great. We you know always need more. I don't know if there are SQL Starters anymore, but you know, well, they're called Data you know, Saturdays now. They're a little bit less oh. common than uh, okay. SQL well, Saturdays were. Data Saturdays. Yeah. Great. Data Saturdays. Um, but you know, not like, just. Or not only SQL. I mean, in some cases, this is a little bit too uh, pedestrian. I think, um, where you know, like, you know, I'm not like you who wants to be like, you know, evergreen and useful to the community. Like, I like talking about unorthodox things or things you might not know about, or you know, stuff like that. Well, you know, you know there, to, there, you there's know. there's ever so e there's evergreen, which is the stuff that people always need to know about. But people also need to know about the stuff that you're the, the unorthodox stuff as well. They need to know about the surprises because uh, you know it doesn't do you any good to produce or absorb evergreen content that leaves people in a naive state. Like they like there there there's always going to be something in the there ha always has to be something in the evergreen content that is uh, unknown or surprising to someone at the end. Otherwise. You know, you're just otherwise you're just reading the documentation to people. That's I'm really glad you said that because I think I have a, a few surprises in my final topic. All right, let's do Maybe, it. Maybe you know, it, I'm it, always it surprised by you. Tea. Though. So, so you know, like, so the final thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, so the transaction log is your friend; you should work with it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's no need to log data that isn't useful that you don't need mm -hmm. to you know sure. like why write the data twice when you can write it once sure you know back back in the old days people would talk about how important it was to get minimal logging um yeah you know you remember you, you remember the minimal <laughs> yeah, logging that, that page, white right? whale <laughs> yeah um now you know like so like what are some things that you can do um you know like one simple thing is if you're running temporary data use a temp table mm -hmm. I've seen developers not use temp tables. Mm. They, you know, just create a keyed, like, yep. user table. And, you know, if that's part of an availability group, all the data gets sent over to the secondary and then eventually deleted for no reason. Mm. So, you know, like, just use temp tables. Mm -hmm. Or 
if you're lucky enough, you have an ETL application, you have a staging database, that staging database is simple recovery, mm -hmm. you know, use minimal logging mm -hmm. or, you know, um, like, like uh, avoid patterns where you're inserting once then updating like, like, like 20 times yep. after it, yep. which I'm sure you've seen yeah. because, you know, it's, you know, to, I don't know how well this example works, but like, like imagine you, you imagine you have to like write a, 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 a report on everything you learned from this uh, presentation. You know, you, <laughs> you, if, if, if you are right, if you write your first draft, then print it. On, on your printer, you probably, which you probably don't have. I do have a printer and, right here. Well, you know, you're a professional, but it's got a printer, think, scanner, I, I, I and think, fax. I think many. Oh, geez, yeah. fax. Um, so it's like I don't have a phone line. Legitimate. Um, you know, so then, then, like, if you if you, if you want to make ads to it, mm -hmm. you wouldn't make the ad then print it again, right? Then make an ad then print it again. So, I'm like, you're gonna have this big stack of paper, which uh, am I? I'm yeah, you get, you get a little blurry. It's all right. All right, well, whatever. Um, <laughs> no, but no, like, like this, it's a good analogy because, like, you wouldn't print it out, like, make the edits on the paper and then transcribe the edits to the document and then reprint it and follow that. You would just, yeah, you, you would like, like, Which... like, you, it, like, at minimum, just like re, re proofread the document on the, on the computer yeah. and make your edits there. You know, or you know, as some people say, you should uh, get you, you should get the right the first time. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's true. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think you can argue that. Doing an insert, then twenty updates is effectively printing it over and over again. Yeah. Because every time you you know you update one column at a time, mm -hmm. so that can be a bad pattern from a transactional point of view. So you know, like I'm advocating to do more work in your inserts. That'll just perform better, mm -hmm. and you know you're not compromising on your your data consistency. Yeah. Um, no, I, I see. I see yeah. a lot of times when people do that because <clears throat> it would make like the insert logic very complicated. And like, you know, some of the, some of the results of like, some of the updates have to happen as a result of what the values are after they get inserted or just some goofy thing where like, you know, there's an insert into a temp table and then there's like, you know, 20 updates to the temp table to adjust certain things based on other stuff. And it's like, like, I, I, I understand why from a development point of view, that would lead to one very complex insert query that no one wants to write. And it's simpler for them to like mentally grasp. Uh, <laughs> well, your hand is very clear. Yeah. That's all right. There we there go. We go. We've, we've, made, we've, we've, we've achieved stasis. <laughs> no more blurry witness protection, Joe. It's back to, back to convict Joe. Uh, yeah. So like, I don't know. I, like, I, I get it from the point of view that, complexity is hard and like writing one very big complex insert statement is prone to error and you know uh making a change to a complex thing is harder than making a change to like the 19th update that you do afterwards or something but like yeah i mean like in general you're right and to like even to a, even to a certain extent i would rather do like 20 inserts than like one insert and 19 updates like I would, yeah, I would rather just too. continue to refine the data in new chunks rather than do twenty updates because then I can validate each of those chunks a lot easier than I can uh, twenty updates. Um, on on the subject of non-updating updates, in other words, you're updating a column value to be the same as before. Right. Some scenarios that won't that won't run anything in transaction log. Right. Recently, though, I've had to do. Plenty of code fixes where I'm changing that code to filter out those non-updating updates. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm doing that is, you know, in production we have our databases and availability group. Mm. And I, my understanding is there's no such thing as non-updating update for availability groups. Mm -hmm. So we're having these processes which are, you know, like you know they like run once an hour or whatever. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't in an AG, it would be fine. Mm -hmm. but, be, but because it was, we were always basically sending the entire table yep. over every hour. So we actually saw big gains from some, it's adding, adding like a simple word cause where, you know, like, hey, okay, you know, instead of sending the thing always to one, make sure it's not equal to one or not, or you know, right. it's not an hour or whatever. Right. That really helps. Right. And, you know, there's other reasons you can, that, I think like, what if you have, uh, is it a snapshot? Mm -hmm. If you have that on, you don't get non-updating updates too, or change tracking or there's, uh, there's some other things I you can turn on that cause that don't too. remember that 
which I don't remember either. Uh, I, I, I mean, change that. data tracking and sorry, change tracking and change data capture might make that weird. I forget exactly which one and how. I mean, it's not important. Yeah. You know, you, you, you can look it up, but you can look it up. You can blog about it. Uh, a a, a <laughs> uh, very accomplished New Zealand based blogger already wrote about it. Ah. Um, but I don't see the availability group thing mentioned very often. And that is something to know. Yeah, totally. So, like, you know, like, you know, that's one of those cases where it's, it's just a net benefit. Mm -hmm. um, the last, you know, the, the last one I think is even more niche where. We we uh, had an ECL. Uh, this was in the station database. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd have like a, a a like say imagine they had one terabyte station table, mm -hmm. and we we had to query it a bunch of times to transform the data. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had a very long-standing misconception where I thought that if you're selecting you know everything from one terabyte table, you would get lock escalation. Mm -hmm. But you probably won't, no. because you know, like as as the data is read, the locks are released. Right. Yeah. There's, there's so, locks, yeah, locks so, don't accumulate to the point where reads yeah. would escalate. Yeah. yeah. So man, like I I I was just wrong in that for so many years. <laughs> but you know, the uh, point being that locks are written to the transaction log. Yep. So we actually saw a noticeable improvement in you know in CPU cut used by the transaction mm -hmm. log writers just by adding like you know with tab lock yep. to our staging mm -hmm. tables because we, we weren't logging all those locks yep. anymore um yep uh, so you know uh there, there have been a few times recently where even with temp tables uh well actually i shouldn't say even with temp tables uh i should say there have been a few times recently with updates where uh, just adding page lock hints has improved things noticeably because uh, SQL Server was attempting to start with row lock hints because we got a nice index seek for for to to find our data, but the uh, the locks would accumulate very quickly. There would be a lot of lock, a lot of row locks, and then there would be uh, attempts at lock escalation that would fail because of competing locks, but um, yeah, I've noticed that even just for some things, using page lock hints has improved stuff a bunch because SQL Server, like you, you can, like row lock hints are individual locks, right? So you can have lots of rows on a page, and all those individual row locks are 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 there. But if you have, if you use page lock hints, you can just lock a whole bunch of pages, and like you can have you know many rows on a page. So locking pages was a better granularity for things than uh, locking individual rows. Yeah, so there definitely are, you know. During your development journey, you you may run into cases where you need to reduce the amount of data written in the transaction mm -hmm. log. In some cases, you can just do that, and it just makes things better. Yeah. All right, so I, I'm gonna wrap things up here. All right. Er, Eric said he didn't want to go over an hour. He's a busy man. He has to fix his uh, fax machine, I think. Yeah, yeah. So you know, we don't want to run too long. Um, Mom picked up the phone so, again while I was on AOL and <laughs> ruined my download. So to uh, quickly summarize, transactions are your friends. They make it easier for you to uh, do your job. Mm -hmm. Um, your code can fail at any time at uh, any place. Mm -hmm. Even very simple code, which you think is perfect, mm -hmm. the failure might have nothing to do with it with the code you wrote. Um, in some cases, splitting up big transactions into small transactions is the right thing to do. It can be a net improvement, but if it's possible for end users or other processes to see the data in between batches you should think critically to make sure that that's actually okay. I was thinking about scenarios where, you know, as I said before, your, your code can always fail. Is it okay if half the batches occur? Mm. Um, if you're using insert into exec, remember that the exec part, the server procedure will be in its own transaction. If you need to log data that doesn't get rolled back by a transaction, you can use table variables. And, you know, in some cases, you may need to reduce the amount of data written to the log for performance reasons, especially if you're using availability groups. And there are various things for doing that, you know, using minimal logging, temp tables, all the stuff we just talked about. Anything you would like to add? No, that's a wonderful summary, Joe. You did you did better than chat GPT. Thank you. You're welcome.
All right. Well, thank you all for joining us and listening to me and Joe go on and on about transactions. Uh, I don't know. Should are we, are we going to record another one of these next week? Do you have another never green topic to talk about or se semi green topic uh, to talk about? I don't want to be one of those guys who is like, <laughs> yeah, we're, you know, we're going to do one like every week, and then you know we immediately start failing. So, all right, let's well, keep it as a surprise. Su surprise. What do you think? All right. Just, just, just like transaction errors, we, we transaction logs ending up filling up. Uh, our these recordings will be a surprise to everyone, including us. We're just going to ambush ourselves with that. So uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, remember to have those uh, index rebuild jobs spayed and neutered. We'll catch you on the next episode. And uh, I think I have to hit, uh, where is the record button here? Uh, where's the stop button? Oh, there's the stop button. <laughs>